McGill is honored today to celebrate the achievements of one of its own, Mr. Alan Amtage. And I'd ask Professor Bruce Lennox, Dean of the Faculty of Science, to present our distinguished alumnus so that he may have conferred upon him the highest recognition that it is within the power of this university to grant. And I'd ask Mr. Emtage to join me at center stage for the presentation of the honorary degree. Dean Lennox. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor Emeritus. It's my immense pleasure to present to you Mr. Alan Emtage. Alan Emtage came to McGill in 1983 from his native Barbados as an undergraduate scholarship student. When he left the university eight years later, he had earned two degrees and had at the same time established himself as one of the pioneers of the internet. While completing his MS, McGill MSc, Mr. Emtage worked part-time as a systems administrator for the School of Computer Science. Although the internet was still in its infancy, there were already millions of files hosted on servers around the world. The problem he and others faced was that there was no simple way to quickly explore this ever-growing wealth of information. Mr. Emtage came up with the idea in 1989 to index the internet and created a program he called Archie. Archie is recognized as the world's very first search engine. With Archie, what once took hours and hours of manual searching could now be achieved in seconds. After completion of his MSc, Mr. Emtage and his colleague Peter Deutsch co-founded the company Bunny Yip Information Systems Incorporated. This was the first company in the world dedicated to information service on the internet. He went on to play a leading role in the evolution of web technologies. For example, he was a founding member of the Internet Society, a nonprofit organization aimed at the development of the internet as a global technical infrastructure. He chaired several working groups in the Internet Engineering Task Force, including co-chairing the Uniform Resource Identifier Working Group, which created the standard that's very familiar to all of you, the Uniform Resource Locators, or more commonly known as URLs. This is the standard by which websites are ac accessed to this very day. His leadership in the field led to his serving, for example, on advisory panels for prominent organizations, including the U.S. National Science Foundation and the U.S. Library of Congress. Mr. Demtich has also proven himself a visionary when it comes to realizing the Internet's potential to advance social good. In the 1990s, his web development company, Mediopolis, worked for a range of clients from startups to multinational corporations. While doing so, Mediopolis dedicated significant resources, free of charge, to most of the major LGBT organizations in the US so that they could create and maintain an internet presence. In 2017, Mr. Emtage became the first person from the Caribbean to be inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame. This prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award recognizes his groundbreaking contributions to the internet as well as his dedication to the spirit of altruism and collaboration. During his acceptance speech, he talked about his decision to not patent the technology behind Archie. He said that to patent the technology would have restricted the ability of people to both use what he and his colleagues had learned and their ability to expand upon this technology. Unsurprisingly, he's frequently asked the question, why are you not a billionaire? Or, as I've read, a bazillionaire. After all, the search engine business is a trillion dollar business per year these days. In fact, he's very much on record as saying that he is quite happy to not be a billionaire. In this regard, he has said, and I wish to quote, the internet as we know it today wouldn't exist were it not for the fact that a lot of organizations and individuals who worked on it back then freely allowed the fruit of their work to be distributed for free. Mr. Chancellor Emeritus, I present to you Alan Emtage so that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Lennox, and uh, congratulations to you, Dr. Emptage. It's now my pleasure to ask our newest McGill graduate, who's just been awarded his third degree from our university, to address convocation, Dr. Emptage. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. That's about as much French I'm going to speak because it's been 25 years since I've lived in Montreal and I'm not going to torture you guys with that stuff. So, Chancellor Emeritus Meenan, uh, co acting Provost Campbell, Mr. Panda, Chair Emeritus of the Board, proud families and guests, and those of you who are watching live around the world, including my parents in Barbados. Hey, mom and dad. Uh, and most of all, members of the graduating class of 2022. I know that later today there will be celebrations, parties, and perhaps, just perhaps, a few drinks for many of you. So I make a solemn pledge to you right now, and here this speech is going to be short, uh, very short, and then we can get on to the important stuff, and then the fun stuff. So I stand before you here a proud McGill graduate, an experience as uh, uh, Chancellor Emeritus just said, uh, I enjoyed so much that I not only did it once, but twice, and now three times. Um, actually, on a personal note, I am very familiar standing, uh, about standing on the stage, as I have had done dozens of times, uh, although most people here don't know that. I was uh, a performer in the, uh, a singer in the Montreal Symphony Chorus for many years. Uh, under the direction of the late, great Ian Ewan Edwards, so many of you will know. Uh, and before that, in the McGill, McGill Choral Society under Mary Jane Puyu. I am deeply honored to be invited here today to receive this honorary degree. I suppose it is a testament to the fact that a young, gay, geek of color, now remember, geek is a nerd with social skills, okay? That's the decision. <laughs> From a small Caribbean island, uh, a, a small Caribbean island can affect the world in meaningful ways, and I'm truly humbled by this recognition from my alma mater. At this point, traditionally, you're supposed to have an old person like me, born decades before you, draw deeply upon their life experiences and impart with great seriousness and big words, spouting great pearls of wisdom that will help henceforth carry you through life. Sadly, I am here to tell you that is exactly what I'm about to do. <laughs> Having said that, to be honest, I don't remember much about my own ceremony those many years ago, but perhaps, just perhaps, some of you will, some of what I say will stick. Please contact me in four decades to tell me. So in, a few, in the few minutes of this speech, let me give you five principles that have served me well and I hope will help you in the coming years. Number one, talk to the old people. Take what opportunities you have to talk to your parents and your grandparents, your aunts, their uncle, your uncles and their friends. Ask them about their lives, how they met, how about their jobs, their pastimes and hobbies, trips they have taken, people they have met. Get the old photographs out, you know, the ones that are not on your phone, and have them identify the people in them. Because when there's nobody around to tell you who those people are, those photographs just become photographs of strangers. I know most of you won't believe me right now, but there will be a point in your life when these things will be of real value to you. Number two, I've told this story many times, but the internet first start search engine started out as a personal project to help me do my job, which I did when I, stud when I was studying for my master's degree. It wasn't some grand attempt to create new technology or a multi-billion dollar industry and put mu much of humanity's knowledge on demand at your fingertip. In fact, I had been using it for about a year before any si anybody outside the group of the School of Computer Science even knew about it. You see, back then, uh, uh, <laughs> Chancellor Emeritus, I had uh, a more modern version of the dinosaur that you took. Um, and uh, those computers that we used were very expensive. And at the time, this is 
right at the beginning of the internet, there was no tradition of allowing distant strangers to use those valuable resources over this new thing called the internet. That's something that we just take for granted today. At this point, I would ask all members of the McGill administration currently present to turn their attention elsewhere. Because when we released Archie to the public in 1990, we may have forgotten to tell our superiors what we were doing. It was a busy time, you understand. We had lots of laundry to do and furniture to dust, and it just slipped our minds for about six months. Anyway, at one point, our director of the School of Computer Science was, was at a conference and was congratulated and praised by a colleague on this wonderful and free tool that McGill had donated to the internet community. Now our director, who was the consummate diplomat, he graciously accepted the praise and said McGill was delighted to offer the service. However, when he got back to the office, we were called up to his, his office, and I will paraphrase it here, what the heck is going on? By, the time Ar by that time, Archie was, used by th was being used by thousands of people a day, and it reflected well on McGill's generosity, so we were allowed to continue. So the first lesson here is it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. <laughs> but the second and the more important one is that you never know where your adventures will take you. I never consciously set out to create the world's first internet search engine, but that's what happened. Number three, most of us know the Latin expression carpe diem, seize the day, or as my group of friends likes to mistranslate it, seize the carp. While it's deeply cliche and it's easy to say, it's much more difficult to put into practice. But I am here to tell you to try to put it into practice the best you can. Try to do the things that you want to do in life when you can. And when you say, um, and when I say that, it doesn't mean it has to be an around-the-world cruise or a fancy new car or a house. It can be simple, as simple as taking a friend to an old favorite place that you've always wanted to show them. Going to a park you've been curious about. Seeing a movie or reading a book that you've always wanted to. Eating at a new restaurant that's piqued your interest. Telling someone you love them but were hesitant for whatever reason. So the next time you find yourself saying, I've always wanted to or I've been meaning to, or why haven't we? Stop and think, why haven't I done this? What's stopping me from doing it? Can I do it? Because your life can turn upside down in a split second. It really, really can. If you haven't experienced that yourself, I'm sure you've seen it happen to others. The other side of that coin isn't so much life alter and a life-altering event as the opposite, being stuck stuck in a rut, in a bad job, in a bad relationship, living in a place you don't like. Yes, we all have responsibilities to a job, to partners, to parents, to friends, to children, and all of those things have to be taken into consideration. And no, we don't always have the resources to do what truly we would like to do, but we can nibble away at the small things, bit by bit. Try to integrate this way of thinking into your daily life. Practice it like you would any other skill. Trust me, these are the things that you will remember and appreciate in your life. Number four. My first year at university, I lived at residence at Molson Hall at the top of university, uh, University Street. Uh, and that January, uh, we had a big ice storm. Now my room faced the mountain and all day long you could hear the crack and echo of branches from the trees as the ice built up and then broke them off, hitting the frozen snow below with great, a great booming noise. So everything had an inch of ice coating it and I thought it was beautiful. Beautiful but dangerous. We all know people like that too, don't we? After the, the rain had stopped falling, I went out exploring with this guy Mark who I just met he was from upstate New York and claimed to be an old hand in getting around on the ice. And while I had lived in places with snow before, this was my first ice storm. And let's just say that Barbados is often a difficult place to go ice skating. So out we went. It was, I was making those little shuffling baby steps across the ice, which was as slick as glass, and following him while he was pretty much walking naturally, and I was pretty impressed. 
Then we got to the top of University Street, and just as it gets steep, he started to slide. I stopped and watched as he started gaining speed down the hill. And as he slid, he grab, grabbed hold of a mailbox that was on the sidewalk. Of course, he didn't realize in Montreal the mailboxes aren't attached to the ground, since they have to be moved to clear the snow. And in fact, they have little skis on them. So the mailbox and him now start going down the hill, pretty fast, gaining speed. Needless to say, there was a disaster ahead, and he was sh shouting all the while, still holding on to the mailbox, which he didn't let go until about 10 meters from where university crosses Pine. The ground flattens out there a bit, and both he and the mailbox came to a halt before crossing that busy intersection. It was a very exciting start to our little walk. So what are the possible life lessons we can draw from this little story? Well, the cynics amongst you might say that university is top and everything is downhill from there. That is not the lesson that I'm trying to pass on here. For me, there are two positive ones. Firstly, you should try to avoid holding on to the unstable things in life. They can easily take you downhill. Secondly, and as importantly, learn when to let go. That guy, and my, uh, that guy Mark and I, the Mark that I had just met, is a close friend to this day. Which leads me to my final and most important point. Number three. Throughout your time here, through all the challenges you have faced over the past several years, it is my hope that you have made good friends here at McGill. In my experience, those friendships, with the right care and attention, will last you for decades to come. In the course of, of that life, you and the friendships will be tested. You will share both joys and sadness, fun times and painful ones. In fact, two people sitting on, the, the two people sitting on either side of me in my first day's clay, day of classes, Francois and Patricia, are close friends to this day, sitting in the audience, here with my other guests, most of whom, with a couple of important exceptions, I met at my years here at this university. If there's one thing I ask you to remember about this short, short speech, is to value and nurture your friendships. Never take them for granted. Romantic relationships will come, and yes, they will go. Many of you will have long-term relationships and children, and the demands on your time will grow. But always make time for your close friends. Try to make time for the events in their lives, the weddings, the birthdays, and sadly, yes, sometimes the funerals. Let them be your anchors in life and your companions on your journey. That's it. Those are the five great pearls of wisdom that I have for you today. I greatly thank the university for extending me this honor and the recognition that comes with it. In a few minutes, you will formally graduate, closing that door and opening a new one, full of opportunities and possibilities. A good university education will, by definition, be difficult at times. But good Lord, it's not supposed to be as difficult as what you all have experienced in the past few years. But by being here today, you have proven that you've risen to the challenges and gotten through them. Please take a moment to reflect on your accomplishments and your successes. And I'm gonna go off script a little bit here, and I'm gonna ask you to give yourselves a big round of applause. You are here, you made it. I enthusiastically congratulate you, the McGill graduates of 2022. Open that door and go through it with optimism and hope and purpose. Seize the carp. Thank you. <laughs>